folks. Welcome to Black Gumbo Southern Gardening. Today, we're gonna have our 20th episode of Gardening Questions and Answers. Let's go. All right, well, our first question comes from many of you. My tomatoes are gone, as you can see, and the reason they're gone is, well, it's hot, and they stopped really producing, and those that they were producing, those tomatoes that, that were still producing, were small, and they didn't taste real good, so I took them out. But I've had problems with squash vine borers in all three of these beds, including my tomato bed. I found borer pupae down in there, and uh, the question was, what can you do about vine borers? And well, we've been talking about that in the comments section for a long time, and many of you have suggested um, have uh, uh, beneficial nematodes, and have I tried them? No, I've not tried beneficial, beneficial nematodes yet, but I plan to. And from what I've read and the research I've done, these nematodes get in the soil, they multiply, and they feed on these uh, squash vine borer pupa, along with a lot of other things like uh, grubs, uh, June bug grubs, and things like that that are in my soil. So I think it'll be a beneficial thing, and I thank you for turning me on to that. So have I used beneficial nematodes in the past? No. Will I use them in the future? Yes, I'm gonna give them a try. And in the spring, I'm gonna order some, we're gonna put them in here, and about a month later, we're gonna dig around and see what we find. And the real test will come if I grow squash again, if we have heavy vine borer pressure like we did this year, or if it's just kind of the normal pressure. So that's question one. I'm gonna try it. All right, the next question comes from Matt Peacock. He was watching one of my videos on citrus and he saw that there were some uh, prohibition tags on my citrus plants, like this Awari Satsuma orange. Um, what that's about, these are quarantine tags and uh, Texas, in many counties in Texas, there are quarantines on citrus. And you'll find this throughout the United States, the southern United States, that uh, there's a disease out there called citrus greening. And it is a bacteria that is spread by the Asian citrus psyllid, which is a, a bug that comes along and it pierces the, the shoots of your plants. This uh, really did a number on the Florida citrus in the 90s and nearly wiped out the industry there. And to combat this, because there is no cure, uh, wherever this disease has arisen or has been uh, found, there are quarantine areas. Uh, citrus plants cannot go in or out of that quarantine area. So all the citrus that I have here has been propagated within my quarantine zone. Uh, that's how I understand it. So it's all about trying to keep control of this disease and there's no, no known cure yet. There is a cure that's been worked up um, in uh, university studies that hasn't been proven yet but looks promising. But for the time being, we, we've just got to be real careful with our citrus plants and you know, not just taking them wherever we want. Uh, we, we need to be responsible and try to nip this, this disease and, and squelch it out as, as best we can. So that's the deal with the, the prohibition tags. They warn us that we are in a citrus area. Even when you drive along the roads in Texas, sometimes you'll see a sign that says citrus quarantine area beginning here or, or whatever. I've seen those before. So um, there is a website that will show you the maps. And these maps uh, have the, the, the citrus greening quarantine areas shown on them. It's an interactive map, map and I'll link that down below. So yeah, question number two, what are those tags about? It's all about keeping control of this disease. All right, our next question comes from Heather Reese, and she wants to know, how is my irrigation system doing, my cheap $30 Amazon irrigation system? Well, it did great. All of the emitters, they didn't get clogged up, even though they're caked with dirt here. Uh, they seem to emit just fine. And you can see I've taken it up because my tomatoes are out, and I'm gonna repurpose this bed for other things. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the connections are nice and firm. As I say that, I pull one off. But the connections of the hose to the little nipples here that uh, secure the emitter to the hose, they're tight. The sun has baked it. They're on there almost permanently. I can't get them off. I didn't have any blowouts either. Now, the issue I had with this little $30 system is I didn't get to use it that much. And so um, I wasn't able to test it as, as much as I wanted to. And that's because we had tons and tons of rain this year. I only got to use it maybe five times. And, uh, but during those five times, I had no blowouts, it worked fine. I ran it for about 15 minutes each time. 
it put out a nice amount of water on my plants. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the, this cheap, uh, this, this very cheap system off of Amazon. Um, I have a video on that. You can go check that out up there. And in that video, there's a link to this product. Or, I mean, come on, you don't need the exact one. There are dozens and dozens of these cheap systems uh, made in China, all the same kind of components. Just look at them and find the components that you need for your garden. They've got these little drip emitters. They've got spray emitters. They've got all kinds that you can customize to your liking. So I did have suggestions that I should use a pressure regulator on my system to avoid blowouts, but I didn't have to do that. I set my spigot at the wall over there on my house uh, I have a, a manifold with four different uh, faucets on it and the one dedicated to this system, I just set it where the pressure was just right and I haven't had to, uh, to worry about it. So I just turned the water on over there at the wall and, and it worked. So yeah, really good system, worthwhile. I think it's worth your time. It's hard to show you all these blackberries. They're so long and uh, these, uh, these canes are super long, like four or five feet long. I've got to get out here and top them so they'll branch out. But uh, yeah, these blackberries are doing really well. I've been real impressed with them. This is an old lasagna garden that I planted them in. They're gonna live here permanently. I'm gonna have to find some sort of a trellising solution for these. Uh, and they are back here by my air conditioner. Sorry, it's kind of loud back here, but yeah, that's what they are. Um, Mandude85 wanted to know what kind of blackberries I'm growing. So let's get out of this noisy area and I'll talk about that. Okay, so over here in this raised bed, I've got another variety growing and it's doing quite well, but not quite as well as the ones in the ground. The varieties I'm growing are thornless blackberries and they are uh, the Cado thornless blackberry, the Osage thornless blackberry, the Natchez thornless blackberry, and I'm growing a Prime Arc Freedom thornless blackberry. Now I did lose one of them and since I've lost the labels on these, I don't know which one I lost, but uh, let's see if I can tell you. Actually, I don't see the label on this one here. There was one over here that's, that I lost, and it was the, the Osage Thornless Blackberry I lost, and the one over here that I lost, well, it's no longer there. So those are the varieties that I'm growing, and uh, so far so good, they're doing quite well. Uh, these over here are a little bit crowded by these flowers that are, are pollinator attractors. But uh, yeah, my chief blackberry patch over by my air conditioner where it's too loud to talk about. Those are the varieties I'm growing and uh, yeah, I hope to have some blackberries next year. They're doing really well. I had a question from Andrea Tyree. She says, how close do you think the growing conditions and the advice that you give on your channel are applicable in Lincoln, Nebraska? It seems that um, some would be the same, and she can't find uh, a, a YouTube channel close to her area that's doing the same thing. The closest one is in Michigan. So she wants to know my thoughts. Well, um, the thing about gardening is, in, at least in North America, most of the advice is all the same. The only difference is in where the timing of that garden practice is, is applied to your garden. For example, most gardeners follow the average last frost date. And when that average fr last frost date comes in the, uh, you know, the late winter, early spring, that's usually when we start our plants outdoors. And so we would count back six to eight weeks before that average last frost date, whatever it is for you, and we would start our seeds indoors. Prairie Plant Girl up in Saskatchewan uh, practices the same kind of gardening methods I practice here, but she has to start her garden months later than I do and doesn't have uh, as much of a, a fall or winter garden because, well, it's cold up there. Here, I start in uh, March the 1st. That's my average last frost date, somewhere around March the 1st. And so anything you see me doing around March the 1st is something you can do around your average last frost date. Um, anything with the soil, with conditioning the soil, with growing seeds indoors, with pruning, and any kind of garden maintenance, disease control, fertilizer, any of that, it's all the same in North America. Everything we do is, is the same. It just depends on timing. Timing is the big difference. Timing is the difference because our climates are different. Our growing seasons are short or long. And so that's what we have to pay attention to as gardeners. So you can benefit from my channel if you live in Maine, in Iowa, in California, wherever. And I benefit from gardeners all over the world as well. As well. Like I said, I mentioned Prairie Plant Girl. She's in Saskatchewan. I grew potatoes in her method. It worked for me here. 
here in uh, you know the coast of Texas. That's a that's a like eight zone gap right there. But it was all about the timing. So you can benefit from gardeners and channels from whatever zone they're in if you understand your garden timing. Okay, my next question comes from Amy W. And she wants to know what brand of pruning shears do I use? I've, uh, she says she's had the crappiest time with them falling apart or not just cutting well. Um, yeah, I do, uh, I do invest in good shears. And the two that I use, I use this DRAM. The model number I'll put down in, in the in below, but this is probably the one you were talking about. It's nice and pointy, it's very sharp, very well made. These little dram shears come in handy for harvesting, harvesting peppers, uh, for trimming out um, seedlings when you're thinning. Uh, very versatile and uh, more powerful than you think. These are made by dram and I like them. The other pruning shear I use is for when I prune my trees or when I have to take out my tomato plants or something thick. This is a Felco um, Model 2 made in Switzerland. This is kind of the standard, the, the gold standard. It isn't cheap, but it will last you and the blades are replaceable. So if your blades do get dull, you can come back and, um, and replace them. I keep these well lubricated, try to take care of them, keep them oiled so they don't rust. But uh, yeah, Felco is the, is the kind of the industry standard. And so like this fig tree, which is dead, you know, I can come in here and it'll just make short work of these big branches like that, especially dead ones. But uh, this is what I do all my fig tree pruning with and all of my pruning on my fruit trees and my grapevines. Uh, really easy, make short work of it. I used to try those Fiskars ones that you get at the big box store and, and the various kinds you get there. And like you said, they, they do just tend to get dull uh, they loosen up, they don't cut, they, they squash and mush rather than cut. You want your pruning shears to make a clean cut. You don't want to squish the, the, the plant. You don't want to squish it and mush it. Uh, that, that harms the plant, opens up channels for disease. So, Dram, Felco, these are the ones I use. Check out this okra. This is my red okra. Uh, Brian, Brian Green asks about my okra that I grew in pots a couple years ago. If I was growing them too close together, I had four okras in a pot and they grew just fine. Uh, they uh, were about this close together. These are spaced at about 10 inches apart. The rows are spaced about 10 inches apart, so they're pretty packed in there. But uh, okra will grow fine close to each other. This is a vigorous plant, wants to grow, heat tolerant. Uh, you can see the, the bugs like it a lot. There's lots of holes in here, but these okra will outpace the bugs. They will be, be nice and tall. They will provide uh, stalks for my cowpeas to vine on and grow on. So yeah, you don't have to worry about the spacing of okra too much. You can grow four okra plants in a pot. Oh, about 14 by, what was that pot? I'm looking at it now, about 18 by 18. So say, seven to ten gallons yeah you can get four plants in there i did keep them fertilized i fertilize them regularly with uh, fish emulsion and another couple of them i used uh, dave's fetid swamp water which is an anaerobic uh, compost tea kind of brew and they did great so these are healthy they're looking good in fact i've got a few of them that came up multiple seeds in the same hole and i'm just going to let them go so yeah okra it'll do fine all right i got another question from michael Polini. And uh, Michael asks, I planted five butternut squash plants and now I'm in fear they're gonna get me in my sleep. They're out of control. How do I keep what I have but stop the invasion? And Michael means these vines that grow like this. Uh, this vine is all the way over to the corner, but it's planted about 20 feet that way. But uh, yeah, you want some butternut squash like this one, these vines are gonna go everywhere. And this particular variety, butternut, is a cucurbita moshata, which means along the nodes here, like this one right here, they're rooted, they root into the ground. And these are rooted in the ground firmly, I can't pull them up. Um, so it's hard to redirect these. With the cucurbita maxima, or if your plants have not yet rooted in the ground, like these vines here, you could take these vines and gently 
loop them back over on top of one another and redirect their growth that way. But with these Maximas, yeah, I just let, I mean, uh, these Machadas, I just let them grow because they're going to root into the ground like this. This one has rooted into my uh, raised bed right here. And that protects it from vine borers because if the borer hits it down there, and it has, I had a 30-foot vine going that way that's gone now. The borer's knocked it out. But this one is rooted here. It's rooted in that uh, raised bed, and it will root along the path. So this particular squash, I'll get it. But if I needed to, you know, free up some space, I would have to redirect this, this vine. You could gently dig up the roots that have started, but I don't know why you'd want to. But that's what you do. You got you to gotta let them sprawl, or you have to be able to redirect them. Our next question comes from Kittens Purr. Kittens Purr says, I think I've made an anaerobic compost because I did not add enough brown to my daily coffee grounds and kitchen scraps. It's very slimy and stinky. Is this recoverable by adding brown materials or should I chuck it and start over? Yeah, that's a very common thing. That just means you've got an imbalance in your compost and it's gone anaerobic. When it smells bad, like raw sewage, or it just really stinks bad, that means you've got too much of uh, one thing going on. Normally, you've got too much nitrogen. Kitchen scraps and coffee grounds are full of nitrogen. So, yeah, you can recover that by adding some shredded paper, adding some cardboard, adding some, uh, you know, uh, uh, browns, like dry leaves that are, that are uh, quick to break down dry leaves. Um, the easiest thing for me to get right now is shredded paper. We've got a paper shredder, and... You know, that's just instant uh, balance to your over-nitrogenated compost. So, but the, but the reality is, even if you've got an imbalance in your, in your compost and it stinks, it's still breaking down. It's still going to break down and give you compost in the end. You just have to wait it out if you're not going to balance it out. Uh, you could also turn that compost and aerate it. Um, that will also help. Uh, aeration helps to kill off anaerobic bacteria. And even anaerobic bacteria, if you were to use a smelly compost like that in your garden, as soon as you put it in your garden, uh, all that anaerobic bacteria is exposed to the air, and oxidation occurs, and those uh, bacteria die off quickly, and it becomes safe to use. Okay, our next question comes from Terry Furman, who asks, is it too late now to start poblano seeds and plant them in the garden? Um, I've got my poblano pepper here. It's a, one of my poblano peppers. Actually, that's a jalapeno. This is a poblano. Um, any pepper that's a large pepper, it's probably too late. And the reason it's too late is these are long season crops and they love the heat. If you start them now and you put them out, by the time they produce, say, 70 to 90 days, you're looking at fall. And while peppers will produce in the fall, uh, the fruits are going to be smaller. Uh, they're not going to be necessarily as uh, prolific for you. But you could try. It never hurts to try. Uh, I expect most of these peppers to make it well into the winter and continue to produce for me. The poblanos are still producing here, although they're, they're really small fruits. I don't really know what that's about. Uh, jalapenos are producing well here. Um, but these are heat-loving plants. They do best. Like right now, it's about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and these plants are thriving. The eggplant, the peppers, um, the, the small chilies over there, they're all thriving right now, doing quite well. So, uh, yeah, I think it's probably too late, but you could try it. You could experiment and see if it works. All right, next question, Jasmine Martinez asks, I'm new to container gardening here in the southeast. With all the rain we're getting, do you worry about root rot? Well, we've received tons and tons of rain as well. I think that most of us in the, in the south have had a, a crazy season of nothing but rain, and it has rained like crazy. But you'll notice my plants in my containers are doing quite healthy. And the reason is container gardening means that we're using soil in our containers that is designed to drain well. And so no matter how much rain you get, the soil should be draining well. It should be coming out down here through uh, the bottom here, and your plants should be quite healthy. Um, you don't tend to get root rot when you have a lot of rain, but you do tend to get a lot of uh, nutrient deficiency because that rain is washing away the nutrition in the soil from your plants. And so um, if you go back and watch any of my earlier videos, this particular cayenne pepper, for example, and some of these fig trees have been suffering from a lack of nitrogen and nutrition in the soil. It just means you have to fertilize more frequently. When you see your leaves turning yellow, 
and they look like they're they're suffering from a lack of nutrition, just hit them with some fertilizer. But um, yeah, in a pot, if you're using a potting soil, that potting soil should be well draining. But there is a problem with too much rain and root rot. Let me show you. This poor thing was my peach tree. This tree was planted directly in the ground. And when you plant a plant directly in the ground in heavy clay soil like we have here, Normally, it can get established and it can grow like all these trees around us in, in, in the neighborhood. If you plant them and they get established, they can handle the water not draining well because their roots can go down below that clay layer and they can get into where um, the water drains freely and they can have the right amount of water. But <clears throat> a tree like this, we dug a hole, we put the tree in it, and then it started torrential downpour. This was a very healthy tree when it emerged from dormancy. You can see that we pruned it up nicely. The structure is looking good, but it's died. It dropped all its leaves. And that's because down in this hole, the water was just pooling up in that clay. And this tree was sitting with its roots in the water. And in that case, in the ground with, without potting soil, this tree has uh, suffered. It's probably completely dead. It feels like it is. We'll have to dig this up. What we'll do to help this tree or the, the next tree, it'll be our third peach tree. The next one we put in here, we will build up the soil about a foot over the ground with a good, uh, like a mixed bed potting mix or, or a raised bed garden mix. And that will give the plant a little bit of a chance to make it and send its roots down into that, well, that heavy clay soil down there. And even if it does rain and pull up water and that water down under the ground just stagnates there, it'll have enough root system up in the, um, the raised portion that we're going to build that it should be fine. So in a pot, you should have potting soil. You shouldn't have any root rot problems. In the ground, well, you can see sometimes, sometimes things don't work out. Hey, before I leave you, I want you to know that you can support our channel by visiting the link below to Seeds for Generations. Seeds for Generations uh, is, a, is a wonderful family-owned seed business. They've got a good selection of seeds, and uh, I really vouch for them. I really like their business uh, model. It's a family business. I like their products, and I'm an affiliate now. So if you purchase seeds from the link below, I'll get a little bit of a commission. And that's how you can really help support this channel and support an exceptionally uh, good family business that you'll you'll really enjoy once you get to know them. So go over there, seedsforgenerations.com, and check them out, and tell them I sent you. Well, hey, thanks for joining us on Black Gumbo Southern Gardening. I uh, appreciate you watching our videos. If you haven't subscribed, I hope we've earned your subscription today. Please follow us on Instagram, where we share photos of this beautiful garden, and uh, like us on Facebook. There you can ask questions, and I usually get back to you pretty quickly. So happy gardening to you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.